Having canceled all regularly scheduled programs, NBC invites you to listen tonight at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime, that's a half an hour from now, over most of these stations, to Fibber McGee and Molly in a special Invasion Day program. Tune in then and all evening long to NBC for complete Invasion News coverage. Well, D-Day is here. The culmination of two years of military planning and home front production was reached this morning when the first G.I. Joe and his United Nations allies took their step onto the sandy beaches of France's Normandy coast. The nation wakened this morning to a slow consciousness that this was it, and then went to pray and to work, to pray that the liberation of tortured Europe would be speedy and that our country's sons might be spared as much as possible. It was a day of work and of prayer and of hope. The National Broadcasting Company canceled all its scheduled programs so that news of the invasions could be flashed from coast to coast without a second's delay. All day long, people stayed by their radios and read their newspapers. But it is not really until tonight that America's thoughts on D-Day are crystallized. So now NBC will switch to its affiliated stations from Hartford, Connecticut to Oklahoma City so that this united nation of the United Nations may see how common is our purpose and how strong is our unity. In this special half-hour cross-country swing of America, we will also include the latest bulletins from the invasion front as they develop. And here is one which has just been handed to me. From New York, the Brazzaville radio, as heard by NBC monitors, claims that General Dwight D. Eisenhower has set up his headquarters in northern France. The Free French Station asserts, asserts rather, that Eisenhower's staff includes four famous French marshals. This broadcast was monitored in New York. Brazzaville says, when questioned about these reports, Allied official sources are said to have described them as slightly premature. But the Free French Radio continues to broadcast the story of General Eisenhower setting up headquarters in northern France. The news of our landings on the continent reached New York an hour this morning when only night shift workers, radio station and newspaper people and barflies were abroad. But there was no hilarity, no celebration in Times Square. New York's Mayor LaGuardia set the theme for Manhattan's D-Day observance when he called the City Hall employees into his office at noon for prayer. It was not an island. It was part of the close-knit United States, which had seen H-Hour and D-Day come, and which was determined to see V-Day, the day of final victory, come, having as soon as the determination, work, skill, and fight of 130 million people, plus their good friends and fighting allies, could bring it. Now for the reaction from the heart, first of New England's vast industrial section to D-Day, take you now to WTIC... Hartford. What is the reaction of Connecticut to the invasion? Here at a WTIC microphone, to give the answer, is Eugene E. Wilson, Vice Chairman of the United Aircraft Corporation, Chairman of the Connecticut War Finance Committee, and Chairman of the Aeronautical Chamber of Commerce of America. Mr. Wilson. In Hartford, in Connecticut, the reaction was immediate and vigorous. We did not wait for June 12th. In Connecticut, we launched the fifth war loan with the invasion. We moved with the troops of General Eisenhower. Through the press and radio, we passed the word along to every town and hamlet. We began about 3.30 this morning, and soon our war finance committees went into action. The fifth war loan was underway even before workers on the night shifts had left their lathes and benches in our great war plants. When a few hours later, our men and women daytime workers left their homes for the factories... Thousands of them carried our fifth war loan battle cry, We Moved with the Troops. During the hours that followed, there was a tremendous and spontaneous reaction to get busy to buy war bonds. In three hours this morning, the giant whistle on the Scoville manufacturing plant in Waterbury had blown ten times. Each blast announced that another Scoville worker had bought a $1,000 fifth war loan bond. In the town of Ansonia, a high school boy was late for school this morning. He was late because he stopped along the way to sell war bonds, $600 in fifth war loan bonds. Thousands of people reacted to our battle cry, we moved with the troops, and bought bonds in a surge that resembled the buying avalanche that followed Pearl Harbor. In the General Electric Company plant in Norfolk, Connecticut, by early afternoon, the workers had topped their quota and immediately pledged to double it. As the people of Connecticut caught the spirit of this fateful day, more and more thousands of them came into possession of war bonds dated July 6, 1944. It seemed as though everyone wanted that unique souvenir of this crucial day in the history of our country, the D-Day dated war bond. 
At this hour, we cannot give you a complete summary of Connecticut's reaction to this first day of the invasion. We have about three more hours to go until midnight. And right now, all over the state, the buying is heavy in D-Day dated war bonds. Today, Connecticut has done much to lessen the worry of our troops abroad. Connecticut has proven it is with the troops. Connecticut is moving with the troops. And Connecticut will stay with the troops until the gallant men of General Eisenhower's army come home from the great crusade. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. From Hartford, Connecticut, we take you now to WSYR Syracuse. Reporting Central New York's reaction, here is Don Lyon. With NBC's Central New York Invasion Headquarters at WSYR on the air since this morning at 12.43 when the first German announcement came through stating D-Day had begun, mothers, fathers, wives, brothers and sisters of Syracuse and Central New York, men and women in service, have kept all telephone lines far busier than ever before, phoning in questions concerning the invasion. Two of WSYR's top news analysts, Vatabon Kerr, just back from an assignment as a war correspondent in the South Pacific, and H.R. Eakins, former U.P. bureau manager in Rome in the Far East, have been on the air all day answering these questions. Perhaps the most often asked question, or one related to it, is one that we nor no one else, unfortunately, can answer. It showed better than anything else the tremendous tenseness and anxiety on the part of all those parents and wives who have men from this vicinity now in the invasion area. That question summarized was this. Can you tell me whether or not the infantry, the ground crew, the signal corps, the ordnance department, in short, whether or not all services are involved in the invasion? Here coming in over our telephone wires, we had the best cross-section of reaction on the part of central New Yorkers that anyone could want. There was no gleeful shouting and cheering or raucous screaming of sirens. Instead, throughout the city, all churches were open, most of them filled all day. And in the tears and the voices of men and women phoning this station, you can understand why there were no cheers. This was no occasion for celebration, but an occasion for worry. Is my son in this? How far behind the lines would my son, an airplane mechanic, be? Are the troops from Northern Ireland taking part in the invasion? My son is there. Question after question like these, headlines, Central New York's reactions. And then came the perfectly natural but impossible to answer questions relating to the length of time necessary to complete the invasion landing successfully. These were the more basic and sincerely thoughtful reactions of listeners to this NBC Invasion Headquarters station, WSYR in Syracuse. But a little more superficially and perhaps a little more colorfully, there were those usual reactions that one always finds in time of an emergency, such things as being able to walk for blocks in the warm early summer weather and hear through open windows of houses you passed an almost continuous flow of news from the various radios in those houses. In restaurants, people hurriedly grabbing breakfast or lunch, depending on how early they had awakened. At the same time, not tasting their food in the excited savoring of the news from their papers and loudspeakers. This was Syracuse today, D-Day, June 6, 1944. Not a different city from any of the others, but a city fully conscious of the seriousness of the mission undertaken and the time which must elapse before the final battle and victory. From the studios of WSYR in Syracuse, New York, Don Lyon has brought you Central New York's reaction to the invasion. We take you now to WTAR Norfolk. And from the studios of WTAR Norfolk, here's Blair Eubanks. Weeks ago, plans were laid to notify the people of Norfolk that the invasion of Europe had begun by the blowing of police and fire apparatus sirens. However, even though the fire siren sounded at 3.55 a.m. for a full minute, most people in this vicinity were not awakened. It was not until normal early morning activities began that Norfolk residents, for the most part, realized that this was the long-awaited D-Day. Judging by the few windows lighted, thousands of persons did not know of the invasion until many hours after it was announced. But at about 8 o'clock this morning, small groups of people began to gather on street corners. From the looks of amazement on some faces, the news came as a great surprise. In Norfolk, great wartime seaport that it is, the Navy is always predominant. Yet the 40 or 50,000 sailors who roam the streets of Norfolk did not seem excited or surprised by the news of the invasion. Even though thousands of civilians in this area were uninformed, other thousands were kept right up to date on what was happening in Europe. 
These were the ones who were fortunate enough to have their radios tuned to WTAR. This station stayed on the air all night and relayed all the news. Overnight, a few Norfolk residents became experts. They not only listened to the radio, but carefully noted everything that was said. Therefore, when a question was asked, these embryonic news analysts would supply the answers. Here is an example. On the elevator this morning, there were a couple of ladies who didn't know anything about the invasion and said so in tones loud enough for everyone to hear. One of the fair but uninformed damsels happened to ask where the landings were made. Suddenly, a sleepy young man was galvanized into action and spoke up and gave one of the most learned discourses heard on or off the radio concerning the invasion. It was impressive, especially so before it dawned on me that it was almost word for word what Robert St. John had said some time before. The young lady was so impressed that she forgot to get off at the proper floor and consequently rode the elevator all the way to the top. She was not the only one who stayed on, however. I hung around to find out just how long it could go on. Apparently, the answer was indefinitely. Because even though there were regular stops by the elevator, the young man kept right on talking. Before the young lady could get back to the proper floor, the embryonic news analyst had branched off into H.V. Kaltenborn and Elmer Peterson. When his feminine listener left the elevator the young man looked quite dejected, or maybe he was just plain sleepy. He had a right to be, for apparently he had stayed up all night listening to NBC. We take you now to WSPD in Toledo. This is Jim Ubelhart in the newsroom of NBC's affiliate station in Toledo. And the reaction to the invasion of those of us who have been helping to tell the story of today's stupendous operation is the weariness of body and the hoarseness of voice that will set in after many hours without sleep. Toledoans generally receive the news of the invasion in much the same way as the rest of the United States. That is, soberly and thoughtfully. There was relief evident everywhere here that the long-awaited development had finally come. But at the same time, there was anxiety and trepidation for the sons on the beach ends. WSPD was first here with the official news that D-Day had finally arrived at 3.32 this morning after being on the alert since shortly after midnight. Our first action was to inform the major industrial plants of the news the makers of jeeps, guns, bullets, propellers, spark plugs. Their reaction was typically Midwestern. A few cheers, some expressions of concern, and then back to the job of producing war materials. No celebrations. Throughout the day, the churches of all faiths here reported an increased number of worshipers. The Red Cross noticed an uptrend in blood donations and recorded an increase in inquiries to its home service department regarding the status of servicemen overseas. There was a gratifying response to a new request for workers in the surgical dressings department of the Red Cross. The public library and war bond headquarters added many new names to the list of volunteer canvassers for the fifth war loan drive. What about the reaction of Toledo servicemen? Well, frankly, I couldn't find one to ask. But I do have here with me a fellow broadcaster who was recently given a medical discharge from the Army just as he was about to sail from an embarkation port for invasion duty overseas. He is former Corporal Charlie Norman, who watched his outfit sail without him. Charlie, what's your reaction to today's invasion news? Well, my first reaction is like a prospective bridegroom left at the altar. But seriously, I cannot help but feel that at a time like this, my place should be at the side of my buddies. But although I can't be with them, I know that they will take care of the job that I started but couldn't finish. Now, in keeping with that, I should like to say, good luck, fellas, and God be with you. Thank you very much, Charlie Norman. Now we return you to the NBC Newsroom in New York.
Back in the NBC newsroom in New York, Hartford, Connecticut, Syracuse, Norfolk, Virginia, and Toledo, Ohio, all their reactions appear to be the same, grim determination to see this through. Later in this program, we're going to Cincinnati, to Memphis, Tennessee, to St. Paul, Minnesota, and Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and it'll be the same there. Maybe a little difference in the kind of weapons of war that are being made, but no difference in the men from these cities who will use all these weapons, and no difference in the prime thought of all sections, victory and liberation and lasting peace. And before we continue our cross-country swing, here are a few late bulletins. The German-controlled Paris Radio has reported new Allied naval activity. The unconfirmed report says that a large squadron of British and of American ships is cruising off Cherbourg in France. The second communique from Supreme Allied Invasion Headquarters announces that our troops have succeeded in their initial landings and that the fighting continues. It confirms officially the fact that the invasion forces met only light opposition in the channel or in the air from the Luftwaffe. Here's a bulletin from Moscow. An indication that the Germans are weakening in their savage eight-day battle near Yassi in Romania was given by Moscow tonight. The Germans in the last few days have suffered heavy losses and Tuesday brought into action comparatively smaller forces of tanks and infantry, the Moscow broadcast said. From London, a radio broadcasting service to provide entertainment as well as to keep invasion forces informed of developments on all war fronts will be started at 5.55 a.m. tomorrow, the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force announces. The program to be called the AEF program will be broadcast to, over one of the overseas services of the BBC. Judging from this, our troops in France are there to stay. And now to continue our cross-country swing of reactions to D-Day, we take you now to WLW Cincinnati. Good evening. This is Arthur Riley of WLW in Cincinnati. This industrial stronghold, center of the machine tool industry of the United States, took D-Day outwardly in the same stride that has won her the title of Queen City. But... Deep down in her regal heart, she pulsated with pride. Pride in the fact that her matchless war production has done so much to make D-Day possible. Pride in the fact that her sons and daughters are playing active roles on all fronts, and particularly because many of her children are doing their part over there in the invasion area where history is being made at this moment. And pride in the fact, too, like so many of her sister cities, she is girding her loins now to back the attack in the forthcoming war loan in which she once again will bear far more than her share of the common burden. Churches and synagogues here today saw a constant flow of worshippers of many faiths, each joining his or her prayer to the national supplication for divine aid and benediction for the men and women from this city and from all other cities who are engaged in this epical crusade of liberation. And there was a quiet confidence manifested by Cincinnatians as they went about their tasks. They didn't forget to do the things they usually do, such as donating their blood and giving all the other evidences of patriotism which residents of this city give day in and day out without fanfare or noisy demonstration. Tonight, there is only one cloud on Cincinnati's D-Day horizon, a work stoppage in the central plant of the Wright Aeronautical Plant in nearby Lockland, Ohio, is temporarily halting production of engines for warplanes. But that is entirely an unauthorized or wildcat stoppage. Some stores closed for D-Day, some flags were flown, but on the whole... Cincinnatians were too busy doing their patriotic wartime jobs to give much outward manifestation of their deep and abiding love of country and of their unswerving faith in final victory. This is Arthur Riley taking you now to WMC Memphis. This is Bill Reeve, WMC News Editor, speaking to you from down in Dixie. Memphis, Tennessee is headquarters for the American Second Army. General L.R. Friedendahl of the Second Army is a veteran of the African campaign. General Friedendahl was in command of the forces which captured Oran. He was later American field general in Tunisia before assuming command of the Second Army. General Friedendahl speaks with authority on invasion. He says, While it is too early to predict how our initial operations will develop, the perfection with which they have been carried out thus far should be a source of pride to all of us in America. It is the beginning of the end for Germany. Colonel Ron Waring, past national commander of the American Legion, has this to say. It's what we've known would be necessary since we entered the war. It's going to be costly, but it's absolutely necessary, and regardless of the cost, it must be carried through to complete and final victory. 
We must not permit a compromise nor a negotiated peace with Germany. Germany and Japan both must be decisively defeated in military combat. Judge Camille Kelly, nationally known judge of the Memphis Juvenile Court, said, All day I have been receiving calls from Memphis mothers whose boys are over there. I have told them to read the 91st Psalm. It is my favorite, and it is a glorious invasion prayer. Our staff stopped for a silent prayer today, and we read the 91st Psalm together. Seven of our juvenile court staff members have boys in the service, and today was a day of tension for everyone. It was wonderful to hear our president climax his speech with a prayer last night, just before the signals were released by the Allied generals for that invasion for which we have all watched so long. This war will not be won altogether over there, but a big part of it is to be won on our knees over here. God protect our flag, save our boys, grant victory to the civilized world. There are many, many anxious mothers in Memphis tonight awaiting further news of this momentous D-Day. Mrs. Mildred Hawkins, whose son is a lieutenant with the American Army in Britain, expressed, I have known that it was bound to come, and I dreaded this since my son is on combat duty and his wife is a nurse in England. I hope this will be the beginning of the end. This has been my prayer all day. This has been a day of prayer, hope, and anxiety in Memphis, a most natural reaction to the world's greatest military epoch. We take you now to KSTP St. Paul. This is Brooks Henderson speaking for KSTP Minneapolis and St. Paul. The people in the north-central states almost literally got down on their knees to receive the news of the Allied invasion of France. Ever since January 26th, 1942, the invasion of Europe and its necessarily horrible aspects have held the people of Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, North and South Dakota, and Nebraska in an emotional grip. On that day, remember, the first American troop convoy landed in Britain. It was composed largely of boys from these north-central states. These states have also been heavily represented in each subsequent troop convoy to reach the British Isles. Just a few minutes ago, I talked to some of the people of Hutchinson, Minnesota, a small town of a few hundred. Hutchinson is the home of Milburn Hankey, who was the first American doughboy to walk down the gangplank when that troop convoy landed in Ireland back in January 1942. The people of Hutchinson are typical of all the people in the Midwest. They spent the day in work and prayer. Theirs were the intimate prayers of persons who know that the lives of their loved ones know rest more than ever in the hands of a compassionate God. Not only were churches devoted to religious services, but theaters and auditoriums also became centers of worship and petition. In Minneapolis, the Radio City Theater opened its doors for an impromptu, non-denominational service with Protestant, Jewish, and Catholic clergymen officiating jointly. Thousands attended. A similar meeting in the St. Paul Auditorium was just as well attended. Yes, the minds of the people in the Midwest were concentrated today on the news which everyone has expected not only for months, but since that day back in January 1942. And it wasn't altogether easy for them to concentrate. There were many distractions. The Red River, which runs along the borderline of Minnesota and North and South Dakota, threatened to overrun its banks and perhaps peril the wheat production of that area, which has long been regarded as the breadbasket of the world and which has accepted the task of supplying a large portion of the soldiers' food. It took the people of Tyope, Minnesota, less than an hour after hearing the invasion news to surpass their quota in the Fifth War Loan Drive. And blood donor centers throughout these states reported donations up 40%. Communities throughout the Midwest area have been jumping the gun on the opening of the War Loan Drive. And at Plattsmouth, Nebraska, one war plant increased its production tremendously by the simple measure of installing radios so that employees could be kept abreast of the news. At Fremont, Nebraska, Dr. Charles McClellan led a mass prayer meeting. Dr. McClellan was well aware of the feeling of the men storming the beaches. He was chaplain for the invasion forces which swept ashore at Casablanca in North Africa. Many of the smaller cities and communities and villages of these north-central states were ready to express their feelings over the invasion with the blowing of whistles and ringing of bells. Down in Lake City, Iowa, that was the plan, but it didn't go off as scheduled. The emotions were so deeply affected that no one remembered the bells and whistles. But on the Iron Range of Minnesota, they remembered, and by three o'clock in the morning, the folks of those cities were out in force. And they didn't celebrate, though, in the usual way. The men who mined that ore from the greatest open pit in the world decided, now that we're up, let's go to work. And they did. 
And that's the attitude of those miners is typical of the attitude of the people all over the North Central States for whom I'm reporting. We take you now to WKY, Oklahoma City. Good evening, everyone. Oklahoma City's reaction to D-Day was one of patriotic and spiritual determination. War workers at the Douglas Aircraft Plant were thrilled to hear the news that Douglas C-47 transport planes dropped the first invasion troops in France. For well, hundreds of these transport craft have been built right here at Oklahoma City. But these war workers didn't take the day off to celebrate. They stayed on the job. They've been working seven days a week in an effort to turn out 200 extra C-47 transport planes in the first six months of this year. So far, they have reached 91% of their production goal and 80% of the time allowed. But here's how D-Day really affected these Douglas war workers. They're in a bond campaign. Yesterday, they bought $30,000 in bonds, all cash. Today, however, $58,000 in cash was invested in bonds by the first shift of workers alone, and there are three shifts. Close by the Douglas Aircraft Plant is the Oklahoma City Air Service Command, the nation's model air depot. Tears mingled with excitement and an air of grim determination at the headquarters of the Air Service Command as the thousands of civilian employees reported for work on invasion morning. While these war workers are a long way from the actual battlefronts, they feel the pulse of war more keenly because bullets scarred flying fortresses and flak-ridden liberators from the far-flung war theaters are flown to this air depot for repairs. And out there today in almost every office and hangar were workers who are directly touched by the long-awaited news. Many wives, mothers, fathers, and sweethearts of servicemen believed to be in the invasion army gave their reactions to the press. Their comment showed unmistakably how keenly the news of D-Day affected them. For example, Loretta Rummelhart, who works in the Ordnance Department, said, I'm glad the invasion has started, although it makes me heartsick to know that it had to come. I think America will cut out foolish things, such as strikes, and really get down to business now. And then there is Colita Garrison in the Records Department. She declared, the news just makes me want to work a little harder. I have two brothers who are taking part in the invasion, one with the field artillery and one with the infantry. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. So I did a little of both. Then there was the spiritual side of D-Day here in the Sooner State Capitol. At this very moment, the auditorium of one of the largest downtown churches is packed with men and women from all walks of life, gathered there to pray and be led in prayer by pastors of five large centrally located churches. There were other services, too, during the day in Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish houses of worship. And then there were the solemn words of Robert S. Kerr, Oklahoma's Sunday school teaching governor, who said... Let us pray God unceasingly for our fighting men, for their success, and that we may be worthy of them. Dal Mooney speaking. We return you now to the NBC newsroom in New York. Back in the NBC newsroom in New York, this then was the National Broadcasting Company's cross-country tour on D-Day, a program from every part of the nation to show what the nation was thinking and doing on this historic and momentous day. From Hartford, Connecticut to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, the theme was the same, work and pray and fight. Meetings of gratitude were held, houses of worship were thronged. Here and there, sirens and whistles blew, but generally the reaction was one of deep emotion and grim determination. The National Broadcasting Company will remain on the air all night to bring you the latest invasion news as it happened. At 10 o'clock Eastern War Time, the Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States, will speak to the nation. And at 10.15 this evening, Eastern War Time, over most of these stations, we will present Bob Hope and Bing Crosby in a specially arranged program for Invasion Day. Keep tuned to NBC for full Invasion News coverage. Ben Grauer speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm. 